Well, I'm Francesca Compostella uh, and mm -hmm. I'm an equine surgeon as well as a Pilates teacher. Currently living in the UK, but I'm of um, Italian origins. My parents are Italian. I was raised in Mozambique, um, studied between the UK and the States. And uh, now I'm back in the UK and I do a lot of work uh, across Africa, the Middle East and Asia. I like how you slid that raised in Mozambique part in there. Like, can we, can we talk about that for a second? Like, yeah, so my parents uh, are volunteer doctors and they took us there originally for a two year contract uh, okay. back, you know, when I was about eight years old. And then when I was 18, they had uh, continued to work there. So that two year contract clearly had rolled over a few times. <laughs> and I was sent back with my sister back to Europe, uh, to Italy to do my university studies. And from there, I got the opportunity to go to the States and sort of got hooked into surgery, I have always had a connection with horses. Uh, interestingly, it started when I was in Mozambique because at the time I was living there, uh, there was a civil war still going on and it wasn't safe to do outdoor sports. But what was really safe was a riding, uh, an old riding facility that had walls around and, and a handful of horses. And so, you know, it was safe mostly because there was a lot of landmines everywhere. And so you couldn't have just run into normal fields and play football yes. here, there and everywhere. But there we could, you know, it was it was a safe space. So, you know, we could we could do what kids normally do and be outdoors. And then there were some horses. And um, and actually it was there that I got my passion for, to, you know, to be a vet because we didn't really have that many vets. In fact, we had one large animal vet at the time. Um, and so I wanted to be able to help the horses. And that's how it all sort of started off. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Um, okay, so people must be wondering, like, where does this Pilates thing tie in, like, at the same time? So Pilates was a love in so many ways. Um, it, it was triggered by a love, uh, and it became my love. So it was actually mm -hmm. triggered by a person I was dating that was living in the States and okay. wanted me to relocate to the States. And my veterinary degree would not have been recognized in the States. And mm -hmm. I had been doing some, I specialize in surgery here and I, I do a lot of orthopedic surgery. And I used to see a lot of complications in horses coming back to work and, and also in the way the riders were interacting with the horse. So obviously okay. a lot of the times if you've got an orthopedic condition, you know, you'll, you'll prefer to use one side of your body. Yes. Now, if you're the horse, you know, that, that will have an impact on the rider and vice versa. Um, so I had, had started looking at it and got really fascinated by the concept of Pilates. And I thought, well, if I'm going to relocate to the States, I could work as a Pilates teacher and open a studio there that looks at the two things because then I could still use my veterinary degree while yes. using what I learned in Pilates. Right. Um, and so that's how it started. And then, you know, as things happen, you know, some loves fizzle out and others become stronger. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm really pursuing the Pilates. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, say no more. May my ex never see this video. <laughs> right. That's too funny. Um, so we'll stay centered on the Pilates part. We'll leave the love, love life piece like just slightly <laughs> For off another camera. Conversation, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, what was it that fascinated you? And the reason why I asked that is because when people talk about their first Pilates class, they may say, I hated it because it was boring. And now I'm teaching. I make sure that every class is so interesting so people don't have that first negative experience. Uh, but you said fascinating. So what was it about it that, that, that caught you in that way? There was the things that are completely related to me. So obviously, I, I'm not sure how the training is, is in Canada and in other places. But um, I went to Body Control Pilates and did my training there and absolutely loved it. And mm -hmm. uh, the first time I went, I walked out thinking, oh, my goodness, if I was a horse that had put me down, you know, I am so asymmetric. I yes. can't move properly. You know, they've asked me to do really yes. basic things. I thought I was, you know, I was nailing it and I couldn't even move my feet in the right, you know, with my eyes Hi, closed. It you? was dreadful, <laughs> absolutely dreadful. You know, yes. I was so conscious of how I was even walking out of that place. It was really, it deflated me, but in a way that I wanted mm. to be better. Um, and then yes. when I started understanding Joseph Pilantis' life, actually, and the fact that he was an amazing physiotherapist in, in so many ways, it was a lot of what he was saying and a lot of what he was studying and working on is completely applicable to horses. And so a lot of those things resonated mm -hmm. in my professional life. Um, yes. You probably wouldn't be aware, but one of the top three conditions that we find in horses is something called kissing spine. 
okay. it's where the top of your spine, so on top of your, of your vertebrae, you've got these little protuberances that come up. And, and if they start rubbing each other uh, in horses, it causes real big issues and you can't ride the horse anymore. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had started devising surgeries where we would cut off those bones. You know, we cut the muscles, we inject them. We do all sorts of really vicious surgical things. And actually, when you look at it, most of those horses lack core. So if they engage their core, suddenly those little spiky bits that are at the top, instead of being squeezed yeah. in, would, would create that space. So, yes. you know, those horses would be comfortable and they wouldn't go through a procedure. Uh, and it was very basic. Okay. So there was a lot of these things that right. started going, oh. And then, you know, four point kneeling, a lot of the work that we were doing, the cat, I think, oh gosh, this is exactly what I asked my horse to do. You know, it's, it's exactly the same type of movements. Yes. Um, so I started really looking at horses differently. And, and, and as I said, and then also with the riders, because everything, you know, it's, it's a loop. They feed into each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's such a fascinating conversation. The conversation I've had with Julie, where she would talk about that, the horse being almost an extension of your body and what, you know, whatever the, the horse is behaving a certain way and your body responds to it, and that impacts your spine or your hips or whatever. A hundred percent. I mean, Julie does loads of work in it. She's, she's amazing at it, you know, and she's got a real good understanding of the rider and we've worked together in the past, you know, where I bring more of the experience of what's happening with the horse per se. And, you know, sometimes it does end up, you know, causing conditions that need treatment as same as in humans. You know, if you, if you've got a, sure. a disc prolapse, you know, it, there's only so much that you can do to relieve the pain. And then you do need doctors, same thing. You know, if a horse comes in and they've got a ligament injury, then, then we've got to treat that as well as balancing the body out. But if you don't do the two things together, it's a vicious circle and it'll keep coming yes. back. And Julie's right. absolutely right. You know, it's, it's like a dancing partner. If one of mm -hmm. you isn't dancing properly, the other one has to carry you. And after so long, they will feel the, you know, the, the stress of that. Absolutely. I just and I just want to spend a little more time in this vein because I'm sure there's someone who's watching this or who's going to watch this after who has a passion for the two and has no clue how to marry the two. It's, it's extremely complicated still because you don't yeah. have a lot of crossover. Um, so there's a bit of taboos that are going out there. You know, when I even when I speak to my colleague and I say, oh, I do Pilates and I use a lot of those concepts for the horses, they look at me a bit, a bit like, God, really? You know, can yes. you not do normal medicine? And mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's, it's going to have to grow. And, and these things, you need to gain evidence that people understand and they can they themselves trial. Um, and right. what we don't have a lot of is probably, so I've ridden since I was a kid. So I, I experiment the things that I think might work. Um, sure. And um, I'm blessed to have a lot of broken horses that I get given. So I get to, you know, work with them and, uh, and together we get better. Um, right. So, you know, there, there needs to be a lot more work um, done or, or a lot of, I mean, what you're doing today is brilliant uh, to broadcast those findings. You know, what Julie is, is, is publishing and what she's got on her Instagram, social media accounts and all of that, you know, that's fabulous. That's where people can go to get some assistance. Um, yes. A lot of the times when you go directly, you know, if you go to a Pilates teacher, they focus on the human. You go to a vet and they focus on the animal, but they don't seem right. to talk to each other. So probably the way forward would be to get the vets to go to some Pilates lessons and get some of the Pilates teachers on the horses and then we could marry the two things. Uh, but it's still Absolutely. an infant days, you know, on that. Um, you know, I, I'd say there's probably yes. handfuls of us that, that are doing the two things and they can look at it more holistically. Right. Those early adopters, right? Like those- The pioneers. That, <laughs> the pioneers, yeah, like legit. And, but like, and it's, you know, it's, it's a different conversation, but it's the same conversation when people ask me, how do you get men to do Pilates? So for me, it's relatively easy because there's a high okay. component of male riders still. So okay. that's, yeah. And, um, and, and I tend to uh, enhance some of the classical Pilates with uh, things that they recognize you know, so I will, if they find it really easy, I'll physically weigh them down. So, you know, I will add resistance bands or things that challenge them until they realize. I think sometimes they need to focus on something different until, before they can realize that the movement isn't correct. And yes. then they start going, oh, actually, I can't really do that. And then I introduce women slowly into the group uh, and challenge them against each other. So some of it is a bit of feeling self-conscious, I think. Um, there's mm -hmm. less so with riders. Uh, I also teach in a, in a gym. So I teach 
at a place that's called Conscious Equestrian. It's a riding yard um, owned by a lady called Ali Danes, who's a, who's a brilliant eventer. She teaches now. She's really well known. She's a judge. Mm -hmm. And she's doing a great activity where she brings, um, she talks about how to keep horse riders fit in, in every way. So not just physically yes. fit, but mentally fit, you know, and yeah, um, she's got a, a lot of an emphasis on the burnout of riders and, you know, and the stress that they undergo being athletes, you know, that have to, to work hand in hand with a horse. So, you know, it's a partner that has their own issues. You've got difficulties in communicating. Yes. Anyway, so I teach there and then I teach at the gym. So I get men that are horse riders and they're used to being around women and they, you know, they compete against women all the time. And their biggest issue is uh, they always think they're fitter and more agile than they are. So as yes. I said, you've got to challenge them a little bit more before they realize that oh, maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't as easy as I thought it was. Uh, well, you know, when I work in a normal gym, my personal experience is a lot of them feel a bit shy. You know, all of the other guys are out doing weights and they're inside doing, you know, what looks like half a dance move. Um, right. So again, normally it's it's about getting them to do an exercise that you know is challenging, and when they mm -hmm. see a lady being able to do it on the mat next door, they kind of go, "Okay, now I really want to do this." Um, yes. But yeah, it's it's challenges. Uh, well, I, I tr challenges trigger me, so I, that's what I tend to use because that's where I feel comfortable. Well said. We all have our personal training is personal. I always say, right? So there's going to be people who want a challenge, and like you said at the beginning. It was deflating, but made me want to be better. That sense of, okay, I'm challenged, challenge accepted. You got me today, but I'm coming back, right? Like, as opposed to, you got me today, see you never. Exactly. Um, so that challenge is the piece. And the challenge can, doesn't necessarily have to be a strength challenge. Like, I'm going to make this so difficult, you can barely do it. It could be a mobility challenge. Like, you can rotate this far this way. How much can you rotate the other way? Oh, that's not balanced? Okay, that's interesting. I wonder why you can't do that. Like, you know what I mean? That kind of challenge too, right? Yeah. And, and you know, it, in, in the studio, we've got the advantage of having a lot of equipment. Actually, what I find on yards is you can use different horses. So sometimes people go, oh, my horse won't do this move. Uh, and you look at their body and you think, actually, you're not doing, you know, like you, you are not rotating your spine properly. You're not, yes. your core isn't engaged. You know, your pelvis isn't in, in alignment. And then you right. say, right, let's get, you know, look at this rider and they can do it on that horse. Right. Let you get onto that horse. Let's do it together and let them get onto yours. And suddenly they yeah. go, oh, okay. Uh, and then you bring them down on the mat and then you work with them there or you bring them in the studio and you work with, with equipment there so that right. they can see it. It's, um, sometimes I think bizarrely it's easier on a yard when you've got that conversation. It's, yes, because it's, it's easy to apply what, they're, like, what you're trying to get them to do. To yes, see. And, and normally horses back you up. They're really good at backing you up. You, know? <laughs> you can have that conversation with them and go, you've got to do this for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You've got some yeah. allies in there. And, and I think as well, like you said, you know, it's great <laughs> having a challenge, but it's about knowing how to make yourself open and welcoming to people. Because one thing I don't respond to is, is you know, those drilling challenges, you know, like sort of army style challenges. That, yes, you know, that let I me would, just bury you today. Yeah, I'd be like, okay, off you go, see you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a fine balance. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been on a horse, Martin? Uh, I was saying this when I had Julie on the other day. My horse experience, yes, I have. Short answer is yes. Um, but when my, I had a friend who had like worked at a camp when we were teenagers. So we went out to this place called Teen Ranch and then we just drove up to visit him. And then we got on the horses and we kind of trotted out to this big open field. And he looked at me, he's like, you want to race? <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, so that was my first time on a horse, just going as fast as we can through the countryside, which was uber fun. And then my second time on a horse was like in a stable with a helmet trotting around. So now I missed that first experience because I thought it's been lame ever since, right? Like, I'm surprised you could still walk the day after that, Martin. Well done, you. Look at that. <laughs> well, you know, this is young and agile. <laughs> um, but there's something to be said for that. that Sorry, so somebody like tried that. to uh, jump in there. Uh, yeah, no worries. No. Um, that the sense of challenge and connecting with people and the language that we use, like being able to understand the language that you need with riders or the language that you need with, with fellow uh, you know, colleagues, the language that we need with different people to make the work make sense to them. 
Yeah, it's a, it's relatively easy. Well, it was easy for me because I started as a horse rider as a kid and then I worked with horses. So a lot of the terminology is you just pick it up. Um, but yes. if you had never done it, so if you're a Pilates teacher and you want to go into the more equestrian world, it is very difficult because you will inevitably be judged because you don't refer to the right part of the horse's leg in the right way. I'll give you, there's yes. a really funny example. You know, the, the front, of the, like the front legs, in the middle, we call what the corpus, anatomical corpus, which would be your wrist, in horsey terms, that's the knee, which doesn't uh, make any sense. Right. So, you know, if somebody said, oh, he's a bit stiff on the knee, you know, a, a Pilates teacher would look behind and would start to look mm -hmm. for a knee. And, and yeah. so the riders would look at you and go, okay, well, then you couldn't possibly know what's wrong with my horse. You know, so, so you do have yes. to pick up an additional layer of, you know, the lingo. Um, yes. But, you know, but it's the same if you're working with really, really young people in Pilates and, you, you know, you're not down with the kids with the lingo. They look at you a bit funny. You know, you yes. can't understand them. So, yeah, there's, there's a bit Absolutely. of that. Um, it's not rocket science. You know, if you buy a few of the magazines that come out, you'll quickly pick it up. Um, sure. And then if you're staying on yards helping people, you, again, it's, it, it'll be pretty easy to pick that up. But yes, Absolutely. the language you need to use, you need to refer to the right language. And depending on the disciplines, the disciplines are completely different. And the rider's position and what is required of the horse is completely different from a physique point of view as well. Sure. So a bit like a, a doctor, you know, you wouldn't be a doctor of all trades. You know, you, you would specialize sure. in certain areas. So even as vets, you know, if you're doing horse racing work, that's, you, you know, you can see certain conditions. And mm. the riders on there tend to be really, really light. They have, you know, their legs are tucked up underneath them. You know, they're crouched down. Uh, as opposed to if you're working on a dressage yard, you know, and it's more of a dancing ballerina style of work, yes. everything is a lot more elongated, lifted. And mm. So again, the type of muscles and the movements that you ask of both the horse and the rider sure. will be completely different. And the language that you use is completely different. Um, you know, Absolutely. the type of material that you use on them and, and the exercises that you're asking are completely different. So that can be a small barrier to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. But again, you know, if you find people like Julie or myself or that, you know, that, that, that can, you know, help you a little bit through it, it's, it's easy to pick up. I, I like the fact that you're talking about those nuances. Uh, Cause I have, uh, I've had people on here who work with like NFL, like American football players, right? And you can say, well, I play football, so I can help these Pilates people or they, everyone is really tight in their hamstrings. So we'll just do that. But when I was talking with her, she's like, well, you have, everyone has a different position on the field. So if I have an offensive lineman who needs this or a wide receiver who needs this or a quarterback who needs this, and then you take it down another level, like all the defensive guys, there's an inside linebacker who's like a taller, more agile guy, and outside linebacker, and an inside linebacker is more like a thicker, heavier guy. because he's So there's layers on top of layers on top of layers of being able to be able to speak to the language of what you need to look for and how to train them. So it's not just broad sweep equestrian or broad sweep football or broad sweep golf or basketball or dance. I mean, dance is the perfect example, right? Like the different yeah. genres. So I understand that and that's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and then in, in horse riding as well, what you've got is you're sitting on a restricting tool you know a restricting piece of of, of, of equipment which is the saddle mm -hmm. which in itself puts you into a certain position so yes. one of the things that's really interesting to do if you've got a studio and you put a, the different saddles on a barrel and ask people to sit on them and you can see you know is it, are they sort of uh, slipping yes. off one side or the other how do they naturally want to sit on them to sit on that saddle and then underneath that there is another body which you know from like us, will have different width of shoulder blades, a different height of the back of the spine, you know, behind the neck. Yes. Some of them have more dipped in the back. Um, you know, mm. so they're all slightly different. I, I, it's so funny. Like, it's like, for a second, this is like so out of my realm. <laughs> but at the same time, it's so fascinating to talk shop with someone who's that passionate about the, the nuances of the work, right? So um, for me, this is like, wow, this is pretty yeah. cool. And, yeah. and, and Martin, without making it seem unachievable, at the end of the day, you, you've got to break things down to what is familiar and what is easy to you. So, yes. yes, you know, it might be a little bit difficult to see the combo together and say, oh, you know, maybe that saddle isn't really helping you or the, the way that saddle holds you is causing this problem. But what we can all do as Pilates teachers is get these people off 
and put them somewhere on a mat, for example, and see what their bodies are doing and try yes. and work from them there. And the same, then start to relate. Imagine if that person was manifesting their problems all or, they, or you were testing them all in four point kneeling. And then look at that horse again and see, can you start identifying the same sort of patterns and movements in the horse? The yes. crook of it then with the two of them is who started it? Was it the horse that was lame that made the rider go one-sided or was it the rider that was one-sided that made the horse lame? Yeah, that's, that's yes. the million dollar question that we have every time I see a horse, every single time. Yes. What right. I do know is after a while, they feed they negatively feed into each other so you've got to break the cycle for both so i yes. found that my best success post-surgery was when i attended both you know before i was always focused on the horse this is the rehabilitation for it this is how you do it mm -hmm. uh, and now i do actually both of them together so i do okay. the horse and then the riders come into the studio and then i see them together and then we work together until they're back to wow. they before that is that's that's a niche within a niche that's double the work <laughs> sounds like double the work uh show of hands anyone in the, the chat who's yeah understands that double the work piece i i it's the same yeah you know, not to pull it back to sports but i mean like it's it's one of those things where like it's like uh, in golf someone who goes like on the course and does like a playing lesson with the person right like you can look at their their swing all day long but when you get them on the course and they have all the different dynamics coming at them that changes it all together once again right yes, so. absolutely absolutely i'd love to know from from the audience you know and from the videos of this video and you know if they'll send you the feedback actually how many sure. uh horse vets they have in their in their lessons and how many times they've engaged with them asking them have you ever thought of applying these concepts it would be really interesting to get that sure. overview you know that broader overview um you know away from because i only have access to you know my colleagues and the people that i speak to at conferences or that and yeah, sure. it's not it's not well known yet. It's not well applied or well embraced yet. Yes. And I say yeah. yet. Right. Absolutely. Can you talk about your travels and the work you do uh, abroad with this too? Yeah. So I so I, I trained as I said as a surgeon, and then I ended up doing really high end surgery here. So you're talking top athletes that weren't performing quite as well, and. And there was a part of me, as I said to you, you know, I was raised by parents that were volunteer doctors. And so I have a lot of connections uh, well, still in Mozambique. I've got part of, you know, my extended family there. And, uh, and I felt like I wanted to do a bit more for people, you know, and particularly the animals that didn't have access to, to any care. So I started, yes. you know, I, I found a job. And what I did is I thought, again, a bit like in, in Pilates, you know, it's, if you if you teach people how to do things, they will they will then help themselves and they will help others, you know, because they'll go Absolutely. maybe you should try that. So rather that I do go out, I still go in a lot of developing countries and I do hands-on work on horses there, but I actually teach in a lot of veterinary schools. So I go out and I teach them how to look after horses. And again, it's really interesting to see, you know, that because there's a lot of physical work that is still going on there, there isn't, you know, they don't have the same luxury that we have. So People tend to have to walk a lot more. They have to carry goods. And all of that is done on, on horseback or with horses or with donkeys or equids. Um, so actually those animals tend to have a lot less problems than we have here because their muscle mass is naturally developed from yes. the day-to-day -day activities that they have right. to do. You know to live, sure. um, but but what you get then there is is problems that happen later on down the life. So the wear and tear is completely different to what we would have. So the longevity of life is obviously affected. And the other thing you get is if you look at uh, horses, is for example if you don't have foot care, they end up walking imbalanced, and so they develop a wrong gait, they develop the wrong muscle mass, they develop chronic issues. Uh, but what fascinated me when I, or what still fascinates me is when I look, I always make a point of looking at people and horses' feet at the same time. And yes. you find that it's not just the horse that hasn't got foot care, but a lot of the time the humans don't have the luxury to have properly fitted shoes, new shoes, not worn out mm -hmm. shoes. And so you yeah. find that the same thing happens with the humans where you, you can kind of map the, the two of them in, in having yes. similar issues. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's just sort of my, my vocation, I suppose, you know, I love going out, I love teaching, I love being able to help and create opportunities. Um, but it's, it's hugely rewarding because I learn, I learn so much. That's the thing right there, like the, that which we learn. 
Uh, yes. Tell me more. About, tell, talk a little more about the feet. Like what? So what does that tell you? You look at the feet of the human. You look at the feet of the of the horse, and, and now you start to ask questions. What questions do you ask of? So the typically, um, there's for example, it's uh, if you've got a horse and their foot, you know, they've got a, an injury or some pain down one of the limbs. They tend to use that that leg a little bit less, which means you've got you have less blood flowing to that limb, and as a result, in the long run, what you tend to find is that the hoof at the bottom is what we say contracted. So it's a little bit narrower and then it may not be worn down properly. So it might be a bit longer up to points of where it's completely turned over. And then you notice that the muscles on the shoulders and all down the limb, you know, they're, they're starting to waste away. The spine is rotated. They get sore mm, backs. They get a bit yes. reluctant, you know, they crouch. And then, you know, if you look at, at humans and you see that maybe that person had had an injury sometimes they've got old fractures that haven't repaired properly and they're using one of their legs a little bit less and you notice that the soles of their shoes are unevenly worn out because of the way that they carry their foot and then you look at their spines and again you know the glutes are underdeveloped their spines are crooked they suffer yes. from back pain they're leaning onto the horse so a lot of the times they go hand in hand you know and it's uh, so it starts off with the mild you know just the the wrong wear and tear and the inability to get new equipment be it mm -hmm. shoes for the horse and shoes for the human to you can spot the ones that have had an orthopedic condition that has led to that body asymmetry and they they, they, they nearly match each other they mirror each other <laughs> fascinating um so what do you do in that case like are you like getting shipments of shoes and like are you like like how do you address these things because i mean like it seems like it's it's so uh simple but complex in terms of like breaking those patterns right yeah it actually really helps in a lot of ways for you know my primary goal when i'm there is is to work as a vet you know i need to deliver as yes. a vet and i work alongside teams that focus on humans instead so we provide feedback to each other but I have to remember that my focus is on the animals. But what it yeah. does help me is it helps the owner understand the patterns of the animal because they're living through it themselves. So yes. when I say to them, you know, then my first focus on that is first identify where the pain comes from. And if they've got an asymmetry of the feet is to balance that out. But I can only yes. balance it if I know why it came to be. And, and also it only makes sense to the owner to keep on top of it and make sure that that is a, is a routine treatment if they truly understand the reasons behind it. So at times, you know, if the owners come and they're completely healthy, but I see that the horse has a problem with one leg, we actually have manufactured shoes that have additional pieces of wood underneath that unbalance people. We make people yes. walk on them and say, can you feel how your body feels really unstable and balanced and it becomes painful? Well, this, see, it's exactly what your animal has. So now we're gonna bring them back, we're gonna try and fix it. Uh, and then obviously there's the feedback. So at, at times I travel with people that are, are focused more on the humans and you know, sometimes they empty their own suitcases and leave things there for people, but you know, there's better ways to do it. You know, there are more sustainable and, and have a bigger reach uh, yes. than, than, than that. Although that's a really honorable thing to do when you're there, except then they probably don't have shoes themselves. And then I end up right. having, you know, we, we end up with no shoes. <laughs> You you sound like like an experienced person who's done mission trips before, who has this like broad sense of compassion and mission, and is not like hit by the culture shock the first time through because you it's not your first rodeo, right? Like, yes and no. I mean, you know, I did. I was raised there, and and I suppose I was raised. You know, I'm like, you know, it's a bit of a bizarre place to be in. I think people in Ukraine now understand what it feels like. But, you know, I was raised in a war zone where there was curfews at 6 p.m. and there was shootouts and, you know, you, you couldn't you couldn't go out at night. So, you know, that was as a kid, that was that was the, the norm. Well, you know, until the war was going on. Um, so I, th yeah, there, there's some of those things are, um, you know, they're not, they're not circumstances that I like to be in. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, that they would never come true. But, um, if I find myself in those situations, they're not unfamiliar. Uh, having said so, I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are cultural differences that still get to me, uh, you yes. know, that I, I, I don't understand one of the things I find still quite difficult is this um, disparity between men and women. Uh, you know, the fact that in some countries I'm not allowed to speak directly to an owner. I have to speak to, to them uh, through an interpreter. 
um, you mm. know, because because there's a cultural barrier. Uh, yes. you, you've got to be sensitive to it. It doesn't mean I and you know I accept it. It doesn't mean I understand it or would embrace it, but I, I accept it. Um, yes. You know, and then there are circumstances that get really frustrating. You know, when you see that people really could make a change and they then they can't. Uh, you know, so, yeah. so that you know that that does get to me like it would to anyone else. But I suppose again, I'm very privileged that I get the opportunity to try and do something about it. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, yes. it's worse if you look at it from a distance and you feel like you, you, you can't make a change as opposed to you doing the best you can. Yes. Uh, I always want to do more. So I think, you know, anyone that works with me would be really stressed because I always want to do more. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I, can, that I can experience that and, do, and, and try and help. That's a, that's a very sobering perspective because we, um, I, I, I talk so much about our gifts and our talents, our passions and our abilities and all these things. And we can focus on too much on what we can't do. And then we lose sight of what we can do. Right. Absolutely. And, and you've got to embrace every opportunity. I think you really have to and, and learn from it. You know, some things, you know, you really don't like. And so don't go back there. But there's so many things that we just, you know, like today, I, I've never done an Instagram interview or communication chat, whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah. We're you know, I, this is my first one. But I thought, wow, yeah. yes, absolutely. I do want to speak to Martin and, and yeah. tell them and, and, you know, and just spread the word. As I said, there's, we're still in a pioneering stage. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to, to this remit that we do. So, you know, the more people I can, I can inspire or help, or I, you know, happy days, whichever sure. route that comes, you never know what comes around the, the corner. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'd like to think that people hear this and, and then kind of sub in their area of passion with what they do, right? Like, I mean, it doesn't have to be horse. It doesn't have to be veterinary work. I, I'm not going to go to school for 17 years to become a vet now after hearing this conversation. But I'm here, like, from the things that I'm excited about, the things that I'm passionate about that aren't Pilates, but then connect people. You know what I mean? So for those of you in the chat, I'm always curious to find out what your areas of passion are. What are the things that make you come alive besides Pilates? You know, yeah. and then people may say, you know, working with children with autism. They may say gardening or they may say, like, whatever it is, right? And it's like, well, there is some connection to that whole people group, that subset of people and the work that we do. So that's the thing that fascinates me, that balance and how that balance has expression. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was, again, when I was training, I remember there was a girl in my training course and she wanted to uh, explore Pilates uh, with dogs and how that the spinal movement could work with them and uh, or whether even just having dogs in a studio would help people with anxiety and that's right. brilliant do it you know that's how yeah. some of the best inventions have come up from people that come up with what are seemingly crazy ideas and they work yes. you know no, don't do what's always been done try it a hundred percent and inspire sure. in fact speaking of a spot inspiring i can see there's there's a person that really inspired me on the chat jen uh she was okay, she, yeah. yeah she was yeah. one of the first people that did beautiful beautiful woman in and out you know, those people you got oh, moves amazingly um yeah, yeah she inspires me to get as good as, as she ever will you know but someday mm. uh, maybe i doubt it it may be in this life maybe in the next <laughs> right <laughs> yes that inspiration for sure and I, I mean think about joe supplies himself for me like it's not like he was sitting around following 10 Joseph Plotti is doing the same thing. There's a sense of just throwing out ideas and being a pioneer and having people look at what you're doing and think like, ah, not sure about that. And then it actually has life beyond you, right? So. Absolutely. And I can't imagine that Joseph must have thought it was, you know, all singing, all dancing, really easygoing. I bet a lot of people looked at him going, God, he's a bit of a weirdo, isn't he? But especially because I can imagine he would have had a really strong accent in New York doing things in his massive underpants so i've been right not sure i'd have walked into that studio so <laughs> look at where yes. we are now <laughs> right exactly uh, i refrain from using pilates briefs in here too that's yeah the, yeah yeah i haven't been that bold yet to go around on some of my trips and massive yeah briefs and just <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Not sure how that would be taken. <laughs> right, yeah. You get attention. You definitely, you definitely get some attention. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um very cool. So hi, I just there are some some of your people in the chat here too. I want to say hello to Trauma Informed Pilates. Harry. 
D and, the, and your friend Jen there. So that's very cool. Love your friend, she says. No, oh, she's, she's amazing. She's amazing. Really inspiring woman. Mm -hmm. She's like the encyclopedia of Pilates. If you need to know something, that's the person you should get her on. She's, she's. Oh, one. absolutely. Oh. Yes, definitely. Message me after. I'd love to have you on. I just love hearing people's stories, friend. Like, that's the thing. Like, it really is just hearing people's story. Like so many people, so many times people are like, ah, I don't know if I have enough to fill an hour. Or I'm not sure if you want to hear my story. And I'm like, actually, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I how do. did you get into Pilates? Well, I was in personal training uh, and actually funny enough, like I'm, my background is social work, right? So I have a, a degree in marriage and family therapy and was working with youth at risk and I was taking kids to the gym just to do workouts because I played, you know, American football, you know, through university and high school and all that stuff. So I got to a point where I was realizing I was having better conversations with youth in the weight room than like on the, you know, the therapy couch, so to speak, right? So uh, decided I'm just going to start the start the personal training thing, and that was 20 years ago, and uh, never went back to it. Um, and then later, as I was working in gyms and big box gym settings and stuff, I had an opportunity to do some Pilates, and uh, Pilates helped me when I was playing football. I did it, and that helped me with you know I was going to a chiropractor a lot, and then doing Pilates, and the Pilates became like prehab instead of rehab. So I recognized the value of Pilates there. And then fast forward another 10 years, had an opportunity to learn Pilates and recognize as a personal trainer that one, there's not that many guys doing Pilates. And two, there's not that many black people doing Pilates, right? So I'm like, I kind of have a corner on the market here. So let's run with that. And I loved it. I've dived, you know, I've dove in deep on it. I've done apprenticeships. I've just continued to make that my thing and recognize that, uh, you know, Pilates was designed by a man you know, with men in mind. So um, someone was using the handle real men do Pilates. And I love that. So I've decided to just own it, right? So I have that as my handle now. And I just put a lot of pictures up and challenge men to, to do Pilates because I feel like it's a missing link for their, for their workouts, whether you're a pro athlete or you're you know, a dad, just, you know, you're a 50 year old professional dad with a three year old at home. And you're thinking, how am I going to make it? This is for you, right? So that's kind of become my thing where I'm just really diving into letting men recognize that this is a missing link for the workouts. And this is something that can add years to your life and, and life to your years. So that's my thing. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much muscle you've got on you. If you don't know how to use it properly, it just doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. Right. And I was sharing the story too, that when I was doing my apprenticeship and I was challenged to stop working out, to stop doing resistance training, while going through my apprenticeship so I can kind of get Pilates in my body and just get a sense of getting more mobility instead of just getting stronger in my strong areas and staying weak in my weak areas. You know what I mean? Like from doing a squat or a deadlift or a bench press, you use the same muscle patterns the whole time. So I did that. So 18 months, I didn't lift weights. I just did Pilates and I got lost probably about five pounds of muscle. Like, you know, my body fat percentage was, you know, I got thinner, I got smaller but I was still just as strong. I was still playing flag football. I was like faster when I was on the field. I was injury free, still injury free for so many years. So my performance improved, but my body composition changed, you know? So I know for a lot of women, that's like, sign me up. But for a guy, that's like borderline depression, right? Because I'm losing muscle mass the whole time. So I'm like, no. And I, you know, I was telling my wife, like, if, I, if I'm like slower on the field or if I'm weaker on the field, I'm going back to lifting weights. And the plot is like, it was, it made a difference. Like my mobility was better. I was strong in those weak spots. Like I just like the same stuff we're talking about full circle with like, uh, with riders and horses. Like you get into these movement patterns where you just stay weak in some areas and Pilates exposes those weak areas and it just makes you strong there as well as your big muscles. Right. So I was like, I just feel like I'm just stronger and more connected in my body. And now I've reintroduced weights again. And I feel like the weights make more sense. Like, and my strength is there and there's like this nice balance. So that come, you know, becomes my message for guys. Like this can make a difference for you. A hundred percent. And I think like with everything, it's about combining, you know, training methods. And, and so I yes. use Pilates together with other things. So, you know, if uh, say, you know, with a horse or with a rider, if you've got a lot of fat that you need to shed, 
um, then we're going to do running as well as doing your Pilates. And then we're going to get the aerobics workout going as well as that. Yeah. If instead, actually, you've got, like you say, you're, you know, loads of strength, a huge muscle mass, but you haven't got the mobility, then at times you've got to drop that, get that mobility and then start building the intrinsic or, or deeper muscles that are required. Because what you've yes. done is you've bulked on top, but not you actually haven't got that strength underneath. And you've got to right. break it right down to get down to those to that nitty gritty. Um, yes. So I think it's the one thing I find that, that we have in common, you know, whether, you know, you're doing Pilates for humans or whether you're a vet is, is a real good understanding of bodies. And, you know, we've all done personal training courses to get to where we did. So we yes. all understand where the muscles are, how they interconnect with the bones, how things move, yes. you know, what the levers. We don't, none of us, I think, really remember all the names, truth be told, which is why those right. amazing yes. posters are so <laughs> good. Always Dr. behind Google. the clients, so you can sort of look <laughs> over while, while you're speaking to them. Um, mm -hmm. but but yeah it's um uh, it's there's not one thing i think one of the things where people get frustrated is where they think one thing is just going to fix all of their problems and and i Thank don't you. believe that there is ever one thing that's going to do that it's a combination and and sure. how much of each thing you use at, at every one time and for sure and i think that's probably where we come in and we're most helpful is helping them find that balance and uh, you know guiding yes. them through it it really is that that piece, right? Because I, even our clients, like they they go online and they 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 find all this information, but they don't know how to integrate it correctly. Yeah, yeah, and and it right. is you know there's things that you've got to to add on to it is uh, that which we do. You know, I mean, I do it even as a vet. Is that uh, your diet that needs to be looked at as well? How does that affect you? Uh, you know, sure. your your yeah. brain. Gosh, I mean, I've seen. You know, I see it in horses where you can't speak to them. And I've seen little horses that are so determined and they'll get, you know, they'll do whatever you ask them to. And then I've seen really able animals that have a much better physical, you know, aptitude to it that just yes. don't, you know, they don't engage and it doesn't work. And the same happens in humans. You know, when they say yes. mind, mind over body, not all the time, but, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. I, yeah, I find what I'm doing, there's a, there's a machine in the gym that I'm trying to conquer. The, is, I think it's the, the stair, the stair master. Yeah, master yeah. Partner, I, yes. I keep telling my mind that it is mind over body, but it's um, clearly not in that case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Iron Nine Pilates uh, said, yes, just finished training a bodybuilder to help her maintain strength and gain more mobility. Uh, preach it, Fran. And then lastly, down, it says tons of info, but being able to integrate and put it into proper practice. That is, that's so key, right? You said a line too in there, which I thought was cool. And they could, you could make your own business off of it alone. You said that strength underneath. And that I think that is really captures what I'm trying to get guys to understand. It's like, there's that, that underneath strength, not just like, look at my bicep, but all of those intrinsic muscles, all those little things. Like, but that's like layman's terms. That underneath strength. Is your core really strong or do you just have like a nice fancy six pack? Totally, totally. I think anyone that scrubbed a pan really could, uh, could show you, you know, can you get that burnt bit off the bottom of the pan with your little muscles? And it doesn't matter how big your muscles are. If you don't know how to use them properly and you haven't got the little intrinsic ones, that pan's going to stay dirty. That's what I'd get them to do. Burn a pan and give it to them to get clean and show them <laughs> what that deep down strength does for you. Yes. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. There is, you know, there's a lot of things that you can look from the outside. They look really well put together. Our bodies look really well put together, be it animal or humans. But if you don't have the tiny little muscle development between those bones, and they're so small that you wouldn't know, that 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 strength the, the beneath that's beneath you you know beneath the surface it just things will they don't work they just don't work and and actually you end up injuring yourself because the that's where the levers are and so if mm -hmm. you put a massive pressure at a distance from those levers that's when you can crack them that's when you can strain them and For stress sure. them but it's a, yeah. again it's it's a it's a difficult concept at times when people can't visualize it properly so another thing that i like is yes. you know we've got a lot of props that we can use because some people understand it better if they can see it if they can feel it some people just get it because you tell them it and they you know yes. they they understand that they visualize it into the in their heads and i'm much more of a i think they call them kinesthetic learners i got to you know yes. i got to try and test it and break it and i go okay mm. now that makes sense to me uh, yes, and that's yes. why for me, even when I was looking at horses, I had to really visualize, well, how does it feel to me when I do that? Um, mm -hmm. So one of the, the main things that we tend to do, for example, is, um, you know, we ask horses to go in an outline, it's called. So we ask them to, 
to you know to flex the cervical spine and, and hold it up and um, and we ask them to be in that position all the time and then we wonder why they get really sore backs and I was I was on the computer quite a lot lately because I was preparing lectures and I found yeah. myself really really stiff on yes. the top of my shoulders and I thought I've been doing this all day for days and then I started thinking well this is exactly what we do with the horses and never once do we let them look up or, or be up and free and I yeah. found a really old husbandry book and I mean I'm talking like you know my granddad's granddad's husbandry book and they used to put for example hay nets really high up in the stable to get the horses to extend uh, yes. up and, and, and extend the neck because obviously they would always be when they were working in the fields to be able to yes. drive they would be flexed they would crouch down you know they would engage with their abs yeah. they would be in a seeker position and, right. and they never got that that spinal extension you know how do you get a horse to do a baby cobra or a cobra you know it's been yeah. like a push now <laughs> they sort of do it when they stand but it's so rapid and actually things like that can mimic those movements and really help them Yes. Uh, but you know, if you went into your box store in the riding yard and stick all the hay nets up high, you know, the, any minute they'd come and you, there'd be an ambulance taking you out someplace to treat you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You've got to have those conversations and speak to them. So again, right. Martha, I'm so happy that you're doing this today because it, so it opens the platform for people to openly chat about their experience and their findings. Yes. Can I say, and uh, um, Iron Nine Plus saying, wow, so fascinating. So just that example of. How, like how back in the day they had it up there in counseling my my prof used to say back in the day for every one new book that you read read two old books and the reason why is because a new book would have this concept and but you you don't understand the origin of where that concept came from and you think that the new book has the newest and the the only thinking but then you get into the old books and you understand where the origin of this new thought was and also some of those lost concepts that make sense now based on what we understand now. So that's a perfect example of that. Absolutely, absolutely. And same as working with people, I love working with vets. I was working last weekend with a vet that's 79 and he's still mm -hmm. walking around the fields looking at horses. You know, we were at a, a cross country event, so they were jumping over yes. natural jumps. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I was having a hard time keeping up with them walking around and, and I think how amazing, but just watching how they do things and the rationale. And the other thing yes. I think is really, really helpful for us is it helps us break down the concepts into, you know, in a way that everybody can understand. So I often yes. think, you know, if, if, um, if a child can get it, then most people will get it. And sometimes we get so, mm -hmm. you know, when we were talking earlier about using the right terminology, yes, but yes. to a point, because we can get so fixated and so into those words that we actually forget what the basic concepts are, which are, are yes. you know, they should be applicable and they should be easy to explain to everybody. Um, so right. a lot of times I've got to think of that because if I go into my vetty mode, I, mm -hmm. start, you know, I, I look like one of those Star Wars people speaking some random language. But, right. <laughs> you know, how do you bring it down and not dumb it? You know, so how do you simplify yes. it without making it seem less valid? Right. Yeah, were you avoiding saying mansplaining there in the middle of that? <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> no <okay. laughs> or like the Charlie Brown, like, wah, 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 wah. Exactly, wah, more wah, like wah, that wah. one. More like that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Sunday, I'll yeah. send you one of the conferences and you'll be like, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Same person I spoke to. I know, right? Well, that's just it. Uh, knowing your audience and knowing how to connect. And that really comes down to just being able to scan and you know connect with that language so um this is good that went really fast it's 11 o'clock friend oh my goodness yes. gosh or, that did fly by yeah or whatever time it is there four or five it is 3 p.m here three there yeah you go. another two hours and it's ready for a cup of tea in the uk <laughs> <laughs> yes um amazing thank you so much and i really I appreciate all the comments and the interaction from our, our crowd too. Like, Jesse, you're doing some really great work there. Thank you. No, it's, it's wonderful. It's just, you know, opportunities, as I said, to share, share experiences with each other. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Thank you for doing this because I know My you put so much effort and you're absolutely wonderful. I didn't, I didn't even realize it'd been an hour that we were chit chatting away. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's good. Feel good about what you're doing too. Like, I hope that you walk away from this. Like I am awesome. <laughs> like, cause this is like, it's a, it is really fascinating what you're doing. So 
I yeah, think I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this video clip and I'm gonna get that last little bit of what you said and you're probably gonna be my wake up call in the morning. It'll be you yeah. say, I am up, like, there you go. There you go. Ready to tackle the day. Get it, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah. so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Iron Nine Pilates, and to Pilates Carry and to Jen I saw there. Please reach out to me, Jen. I'd love to have you on as well to chat. We'll do this. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, and I'll we'll see you, you soon. Later. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Bye.